Hello everyone, welcome to a new lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Today we are also going to cover an important and interesting topic uh, for heterogeneous systems, which is collaborative computing or fine-grained collaborative or heterogeneous execution with systems with different devices. We are going to focus today on CPU and GPU, but in the longer version of this lecture, you can also see some examples of how to do collaborative computing in system with CPUs and FPGAs. One necessary feature that uh, was recently provided by GPU programming frameworks, necessary feature for collaborative computing is unified memory, basically, the um, um, a memory, a virtual memory system that can be seen at the same time by both or different types of devices, or in particular in this lecture, we are going to focus on CPU and uh, GPU. Um, in the past or in the beginning of the GPU computing era, it wasn't possible to have this um, unified view of memory in the traditional approach. We had to do a uh, double uh, memory allocation in the host processor and in the device, the GPU, typically, and also use uh, CPU, GPU, or GPU, CPU data transfers in order to move data from one device to another device. This is a, a, a model that naturally matches systems with uh, discrete GPUs, and you can see here some sample code. You will be familiar with uh, all these um, uh, different APIs, CUDA malloc or CUDA main copy, and then also for the output uh, malloc on the host processor, CUDA malloc uh, on the um, device processor, launch the GPU kernel, and then at some point synchronize and bring the data back using uh, mem, uh, mem copy operations or CUDA main copy operations. With the unified view or the, with the unified memory, it's possible to have a unified view, a unified virtual address space uh, where the same virtual address space is shared across the host and the device. These already started in CUDA 6, the unified memory in the Kepler architecture, but back then uh, was basically a layer that was uh, hiding the double memory allocation and the um, ex um, explicit data transfers of CUDA main copies that we had to use. After CUDA 8 and the Pascal architecture, the GPU can um, um, can um, support or GPU supports page faults, and this means that it, the, the GPU memory can be oversubscribed, and um, the uh, GPU can go to the CPU memory to bring data and keep uh, and continue uh, executing. And the only limit is the uh, system memory size. And uh, not only that, not only the possibility of, of, of oversubscribing memory, but also easier programming with unified memory, because now it's no longer necessary to do the, uh, double allocation, double memory allocation with malloc in the host and CUDA malloc on the device. Now we can simply use CUDA malloc manage a new API that uh, simply allocates uh, an array in the unified memory space. And this way it can be uh, accessed at the same time and then with no experience explicit data transfers from uh, the different devices, from the CPU and the GPU. Uh, there is no need for double allocation or explicit data, data transfers, and these naturally matches uh, physically integrated systems with CPUs and GPUs in the same chip that have access to the same physical memory, but it can also be implemented for discrete GPUs, and this is supported in uh, all uh, recent versions of CUDA. Uh, now, how to make use of these new features or relatively new features to implement collaborative applications? Um, we are going to discuss a few uh, use cases, a few case, case studies using um, CPUs and GPUs in this lecture. You will find more in the longer version of this lecture. Uh, but uh, yeah, in the end, the heterogeneous execution or the collaborative computing applications have always been possible in systems with CPUs and GPUs, basically due to the fact that the um, kernel launch from the host side is asynchronous. So uh, what that means is that the CPU gets free after it launches the kernel on the GPU, so it can continue doing things, it can continue computing. And uh, at some point, uh, using a CUDA device synchronized uh, to, um, uh, to check whether the execution of the, the GPU kernel has finished, and then um, uh, copy data. So this was already possible before the existence of um, the unified memory, but now with the unified memory is uh, much easier as we will see, and also it enables more fine-grained collaboration. 
Um, and this is especially possible uh, after the Pascal architecture that now supports uh, the um, unified memory with uh, CPU and GPU memory coherence and system-wide atomic operations. So we could write code like these using CUDA malloc manage, allocate the input and the output, launch the kernel, and right after that, the CPU can continue computing, but actually can even access data that is being used or being accessed at the same time by the GPU. For for example, uh, these two lines here that, that you can see, even using atomic operations on data that might be also uh, being um, accessed by the GPU, but with atomic operations, we would uh, prevent data races um, from uh, CPU threads and GPU threads accessing the same data. Uh, on the um, GPU side, the uh, system-wide atomics look like this. It's uh, the same semantics of the um, system, um, uh, uh, the same syntax as the atomic operations used to be, for example, atomic add, but with this underscore system uh, to identify that this is a system-wide atomic operation. So it might also affect to data that resides or is uh, physically residing on the CPU memory. So now <clears throat> we are a little bit more familiar with this unified memory and the possibilities of using it for uh, fine-grained collaboration. And we are going to present briefly some collaborative patterns and also some examples of these. Let's start with the definition of what would be the conventional program structure where we have some tasks that can be divided into sequential subtasks. And we will typically have many of these tasks, many data parallel tasks. At some point, if we have a processor computing these data parallel tasks, we might need a coarse grain synchronization before continuing the execution. If we were executing this program on a GPU, the first bunch of para data parallel tasks would be uh, would represent a GPU kernel and the, and, and the coarse grain synchronization, the kernel termination before the second kernel starts. If we have a system with um, CPUs and GPUs that can collaborate in a fine-grained manner, uh, we can uh, implement different data, uh, different partitioning schemes, how to distribute these different tasks over the different devices that we have in the system. For example, device one could be a, G a CPU, device two a GPU, and it turns out that some device is better for some subtasks sub than other device. So uh, we might, we will, <clears throat> we will likely see that these subtasks are shorter, take shorter to execute on one device than the other device, but the other device at the same time might have more parallelism. And for other sequential subtasks might be different. At some point, we might also need to uh, synchronize and then we will compute the execution of the second kernel, but observe that we are basically uh, partitioning the data parallel tasks over the two devices, the CPU and the GPU. We can also do task partitioning. In this case, we are going to have one device doing some tasks and another device doing other tasks. And we can talk about coarse grain task partitioning. In this case, we are basically partitioning the kernels and one entire kernel is going to run on the, on the um, one device, on the GPU, for example, and after the coarse grain synchronization, the um, other kernel, the other part of the program will uh, be run on the other device. Uh, this coarse grain task partitioning scheme also enables or allows concurrent execution because we could have a pipeline and while the um, device two is computing these tasks, we can have device one computing um, tasks that correspond to the previous chunk of uh, tasks that were computed by the uh, device two. Uh, the unified memory and the system-wide atomic operations also enable us to implement fine-grained task partitioning. In this case, because we know that some uh, data uh, subtasks are run faster on one device than the other device, we could use fine-grained communication from device one to device two, for example, to signal threads in device two when some specific subtasks, these yellow subtasks, are completed um, on the device one, and in that and, and at that point, um, uh, uh, threads in device two get notified and can continue the execution of the second part of the task or the these uh, dark green subtasks. And um, yeah, this could be the same also after the coarse grain synchronization, if that's really needed in our program, and uh, we continue with the fine grain task partitioning in the uh, next kernel. We can continue uh, because we could also apply different partitioning strategies for different kernels in the same program. 
Now let's see some examples. For example, for data partitioning, we are going to use visage surface uh, as an example. This is an application, an algorithm that generates a surface um, in a three-dimensional space, for example, by, by using a net of control points. In this um, uh, toy uh, representation that you see here, uh, we are using a four by four net of control points to generate this uh, light blue surface that we can see. And we can do this with a parametric non rational formulation based on Bersen polynomials uh, with these expressions. Using these expressions, we can compute the X, Y, and Z in a 3D um, space of the point points of the surface. And observe that here in this picture, we have partitioned this surface into tiles and different tiles have been assigned to different processors, the CPU or the GPU. In particular, we are doing here a static uh, distribution. We can profile our devices, CPU and GPU in advance and know how fast they can run or they can compute uh, these tiles and based on that do a static partitioning. And then we could even implement these uh, use, uh, without unified memory. We, do, we would simply launch CPU threads and a GPU kernel and at some point um, they will synchronize because they exist execution of the kernel on GPU is asynchronous, uh, the, the, the CPU threads can continue running um, on the CPU cores and so on. And at some point, and at the end, we would uh, copy the part of the surface that has been computed, generated on the uh, GPU, we would move it to the main memory of the CPU. And this approach is um, indeed um, good in terms of performance. And um, in one NVIDIA Jetson we uh, tested these experiments and Nvidia Jetson has uh, four um, uh, CPU cores and two GPU cores, and we could observe up to 17% speed up over the GPU only version when we assign 20% of the tiles to the CPU. But with unified memory, this can be uh, implemented much more easily, first of all, because we don't need to do the double allocation of the surface, for example. With CUDA malloc manage, we can have just a single surface. And then um, again, we can launch the um, CPU threads and the GPU kernel, but because we are using unified memory, we don't even need to copy the uh, part of the um, or the part of the tiles computed by the GPU to the CPU memory. This will be done implicitly. And with the unified memory, more recent version of the unified memory that supports SIPs and white atomic operations, we could even do a dynamic distribution of the tiles. That would say the need for doing um, uh, some offline profiling of the application to know what's the best percentage for um, each specific application. And even for applications that are data dependent or more regular or might have more loading balance, uh, we um, could be even uh, more efficient. Um, so in this uh, dynamic distribution, we need to have some global variable that is a counter of tiles that basically tells to every uh, thread block in the GPU or threads on the uh, CPU threads on the on the on the host side. Um, what's the next tile to compute, uh, and that this um, atomic variable will be um, updated with an atomic add system. Um, obviously, if one thread of the thread block is using the atomic add system, after that we need some synchronization for the other threads. Uh, to see this my tile that in this specific example resides in shared memory, so it can be accessed by all of the threads of the thread block after the sync thread. And after that, uh, we will have the kernel body. Eventually, uh, when, when we have consumed all the tiles, we break this loop and then um, execution finishes. By using this type of collaboration, um, we could uh, observe on an AMD Kaveri uh, up to a 40% improvement over the GPU on version when using uh, the GPU on four CPU cores. Data partitioning is just one type of partitioning. We can also do coarse grain partitioning. And one good example is breadth search, which is an algorithm that we have covered in this course. Remember that we discussed two different kernels, kernel one and kernel two, uh, one for a small size, small size frontiers and the other one for big size frontiers. And we even uh, mentioned briefly uh, the interblock synchronization, the atomic based interblock synchronization to avoid kernel relaunch that uh, you can um, watch in the long version of the BFS 
Express lecture, but it's still um, for the small size frontiers, they uh, underutilize GPU resources, even though we explain kernel one by just launching a single thread block that doesn't really make a lot of sense if you have many GPU cores in your system. In these kind of cases, uh, when, when we really have a small size frontiers at some point in the, in the execution of the breadth search algorithm, it might make sense to have a collaborative implementation. For example, on an NVIDIA Jetson, we observe that the small size frontiers, because they underutilize the GPU resources, run faster on the CPU. This corresponds to the red bars that you can see here in the beginning of the execution. This would be the initial iterations and also the final iterations of the algorithm. And this is very much related with the size of the uh, frontier, as you can see. So with a collaborative implementation, we can simply choose the most appropriate device and at some point switch to the other device, for example, large frontiers process on the GPU. When we uh, suddenly find a short frontier, the uh, execution would go back to the uh, CPU. And this can be implemented as well without unified memory, but we need to do explicit memory copies. Uh, we would have a while loop um, for the entire execution while the frontier size is uh, the, uh, not zero. That means that there are still nodes to visit uh, in the BFS algorithm. So if the frontier size is less than a certain threshold, we launch CPU threads. If not, we launch GPU th uh, threads. Uh, of course, we need to do the corresponding um, copies from the host to the device and, and, and back. With unified memory, easier programming because we don't need explicit memory copies. We simply launch the CPU kernel, uh, CPU threads when we need them, or we launch the GPU kernel when we need it. But with the most advanced version of the unified memory supporting system-wide atomic operations, we are able to simply launch CPU threads and GPU kernels at the beginning of the execution and then just keep them running um, and computing the um, frontier, the computing for the specific iteration, with, uh, depending on what's the uh, frontier size. Um, in fact, we wouldn't even need to have this uh, while loop in the in the host code because this while loop uh, can be directly inside the code of the CPU threads or the GPU kernel because they are running on the all the time persistently and communicating synchronizing using system wide atomic operations and it's even possible to have both CPU threads and GPU threads working on the same frontier. So by using this sort of approach, uh, we could see um, some interesting uh, speed ups up to uh, 39% faster than the GPU only version for certain graphs. Uh, of course, when the graphs tend to be much larger, this means that their frontiers are going to be very, very large. So most of the time we're going to be using the GPU uh, or um, the GPU only. So um, but for uh, graphs that may have, uh, let's say, more uh, balanced uh, uh, frontier sizes, um, this uh, is definitely a good solution. Um, fine grain task partitioning is the last uh, example of uh, partitioning or task partitioning that we can do. Um, here we use as an example the RANSAC algorithm. Um, it's an algorithm, a uh, pretty useful one to uh, find uh, you know, uh, models that adapt to certain observations and, um, um, and this can be used in many different um, uh, domains, for example, in, in, in object detection. Um, and the, in the RANSAC algorithm, we basically do multiple iterations until we find what the best model there is a fitting stage more uh, fitting a stage phase which is uh, when we compute the model and this is uh, an inherently sequential computation and then there is an evaluation st uh, stage where we take all the observations and compare them to the uh, corresponding results generated by the model and we see if they are good or bad we compare uh, the um, model based on what's the, the rank the score that it obtained we compare it to the best model and decide if we replace the current model or not as you see there are CZ and CMD phases here so one thing that we could do is um, 
uh, be, because here the uh, iterations are based, are based so the, the generation of the model is based on um, obtaining some random samples. So iterations are independent, so we can parallelize uh, all iterations and compute them in CPU threads and GPU blocks and have them uh, communicating in a fine-grained manner using atomic operations. So this is a, a summary slide of the collaborative patterns that I have just explained and provided a few examples. As I said, you'll find more examples in the longer version of this lecture. And you can find all these examples and in fact, all these codes in the Chai Benchmark Suite, which has um, discrete and unified versions, let's say for uh, unified memory and, and pre-unified memory in CUDA, OpenCL, and, uh, and even for uh, GPU simulators. So uh, here you can find the link to the uh, website and the repository. And, and here, um, this is the slide about the longer version of this lecture. At the bottom of the slide, you can, um, you can access the recording. And let me remind you that uh, all the contents of this course are publicly available in the uh, website and also in the YouTube play playlist. This slide corresponds to this course, the heterogeneous systems course, but it's not the only projects and seminars course that we uh, deliver in the uh, Safari Research Group. We also have an interesting one about processing in memory systems, which is tightly related with heterogeneous systems because systems with processing memory capabilities are also heterogeneous systems. But we have many more about SSDs, memory, bioinformatics, etc. And all the materials are available in our uh, website and also in our YouTube channel that you can access from the link at the bottom of this slide. This is all for today. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope to see you in the next lecture of this course.